414-5448. You're on high frequency radio. Hey, good morning. This is Federal Postal Judge David Wynn Miller. David Wynn Miller! I've seen the 414 area code, and I say, okay, this got to be him. Don't too many people call me from Hawaii. How you doing, sir? I am very good this morning, yes, sir. Great, great, great. I, I was, I they was had called me at 5 a.m. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know y'all two hours behind us. Um, three. Um, three hours. Okay, three hours? Wow. Okay, three hours behind. So I know it was a little bit behind. But uh, great. Hey, thank you for joining the show. Let me introduce everybody. Okay, all my listening audience, this is um, the, uh, David Wynn Miller. How, how do you plan a potentiary judge? David Wynn Miller, is that how you say it? Plenty of attention is the ambassador judge. The an ambassador judge is a judge that goes out and teaches the mistakes that are taking place and doesn't prosecute. The federal postal judge that I am is a whistleblower and takes the fraud that is being perpetrated uh, through the Parse Syntax Grammar and reports that to five different agencies. The uh, Eric Holder at the Department of Justice, the Tort Branch in Washington, D.C., the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau in Iowa City, Iowa, the Postal Inspectors in Chicago, Illinois, and the Securities and Exchange Commission in Washington, D.C., Wow. Uh, when we su- wow. when we supply them with the fact that uh, they're using grammar to extort rights and extort money, extort uh, foreclosed homes that they don't own, they uh, fines are up to $25 million per case. And the forensic evidence is mathematically certified frontwards and backwards. So that when the cases go to the government, the only thing they have to do is walk it into the bank or the respected agency that has committed a felony and show them the evidence. And if they uh, it's done quietly, not to excite the public, not to excite the uh, the world, and they negotiate a settlement. And it doesn't take a whole lot of uh, a whole lot of work to understand that you've been lied to. Now I'm going to give you a, a, a sentence, a sentence that's written both frontwards and backwards. For the bridge is over the water. Backwards. For the water is under the bridge. Over and under are opposite prepositions, and both sentences are, have the same picture. Now, if we take a math problem, 1x plus 2 equals 3, and 3 minus 2 equals 1, then 1 equals x. If we use a multiplication problem, x times 3 equals 6, and 6 divided by 3 equals 2, 2 equals x. We add, subtract, and multiply, and divide, which is called syntax operation, to get the, to check the math see if it's correct frontwards and backwards. We use the preposition the same way frontwards and backwards are 68 prepositions, 34 negative and 34 positive. Okay, now hold on, hold on. Hold on, David. I want to, because I don't want you to lose my audience, because I want to kind of bring them in on what you're talking about, because it may be some new people on this call that may not be familiar with what you're talking about. And what you're talking about is a mathematical interface between language, uh, grammar, and and language, uh, am I correct? Yes. Where where there yes. is a we, we broke the code on April 6, eighty eight, twenty five years ago. So in other words, and I studied your material, and I have to say this that um, I, I cannot find any flaws with it. Um, we were just talking about it, as a matter of fact, last Thursday. We were talking about this parse syntax grammar, and it's basically that. You can, there's only one way to speak the truth, and there's a lot of different ways to speak a lie, but there's a mathematically precise way to write 
where, that, that will leave no doubt or no alternate interpretation of what it is that you're saying. Am I correct? That's correct. We All are right. certifying the one in 900 definitions of each word so that there is no subjective interpretation to what is being said. We include a dictionary so that the individual knows exactly what the words mean in a document. We identify what a verb is. Is the singular and ours plural? We identify a the prepositions we use as for, of, with, by, uh, of, I'm going to assume on, in, and those are about the and through. We also identify what the articles are, which will be a, and, the, this, and these. We don't use any other articles, even though there's, there are 64, uh, 64 prepositions and 38 articles. We keep, wow. it as, we, we keep it very simple because it's mathematically in now time. We don't use future time. We don't use past time. We only use now time. The sentence I gave you before, for the bridges over the water, if I take out one one word, like the word for, and I say the bridge is over the water. Now, that's only six six words. But because we separated the prepositional phrase for the into just the, when you separate prepositions and articles, they all become adverbs. Now, the adverb the makes bridge to be a verb. Is is an adverb connecting to the verb in front of it and modifying the over verb. Does an adverb connecting to the verb in front of it and now modifying the dangling participle verb water. Show me the okay. verb water over and bridge. It doesn't exist. So therefore, like a math problem, three times three times three equals twenty seven. Three times three times three times zero equals zero. A fact times a fact equals a fact. The fact times the lie equals the lie. Now, what what I what I've seen, and this is what I was very very impressed with, is how you have assigned a numerical value to each one of the um, uh, uh, parts of speech. Am I correct? Yes. One 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 is used for an adverb because one comes before two, which is a verb. One right. comes before three, which is an adjective, and three comes before four because three and four are a natural combination, natural flow. The prepositional phrase is is um, five, six, and seven. Five is a preposition, six is the article, and seven would become the fact or the noun. But the word pre-position, pre meaning no, means no position. When you have a vowel and two consonants, it means no contract. So you have an article, A-R-T, art, illusion, imagination. So the article now modifies the noun, and a noun is spelled no-no, N-O-U-N, is Latin for no-no. So if you have no position and no ownership, you have no-no. So they lied to us about how the prepositional phrase was constructed by giving us words that mean nothing. So what we did is we took a position, which now is connected to a lodial, which is original ownership, which now creates a fact. So we have a position, lodial, fact, phrase. And it's mathematically certified frontwards and backwards. Okay. And then we have eight. Eight is past time because eight comes before nine, and nine is the future, and the future doesn't exist. And zero is a conjunction because, like the equal sign in math, it has no modification powers. And 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 or do not have modification powers either in a sentence. However, the word and is a command and the word or is an option. Those are your definitions. Now, now for those listening, let me just say this to my listening audience. To me, what this, because I've studied this. When, when I started, when I came across your material... I started doing some research, and I actually came across some information about 100, 150 years ago, about 100 years ago. They were, they were saying, they weren't talking about this, but they were saying that they're not teaching us proper grammar. 
And they, I right. mean, it was a, you know, they say they're not teaching us proper grammar. And are you saying that the judges know this? Because, you know, when you, when you, when, let's be real, Dave, you know, you take this, you, 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 you syntax this, um, um, these uh, documents, and then you put it into the public. The judge is going to start, what is this nonsense? I can't read this. What are you talking about? However, I reviewed it, and you're 100% correct. You're 100% correct. I cannot find any errors in it or anything like that. As a matter of fact, I had some friends of mine in Japan. Um, they say they've used your material and syntax and documents, and they said it translates perfectly into other languages. They can take yes, it from one language to an another language, and it will translate perfectly. The website is written in 150 foreign languages worldwide. We have over over 5 billion people in 150 languages worldwide on the website studying, learning about how grammar has been used to enslave the population of this planet for 8,500 years. And if people take time, and I've never been defeated with uh, my technology against any language in any country for any any questions or condition of state they wish to challenge on. Because a math problem, if you don't like it, or if there's a mistake written frontwards, we just write it backwards. And we find out where the mistake is, which is a very unique concept. Even my own computer has been trained to, if I'm, if I'm typing and I use two conditions of state or two possessives together when it should be a, a, a cause and effect, my computer will tell me that you've used two prepositional pairs identical um, and they'll give me a, a green line or a red line will appear on my computer and what model computer I have that tell me I have an error. And so I'll go back and reread it and if it doesn't make sense, I'll read it backwards. And when I read it backwards, I'll find the mistake immediately. And, that, and that, that, makes, that makes all the sense. I, I know for a fact that there is a mathematical interface with language. Um, that's the only way that you can uh, preserve truth. You know, well, it, truth, you know, truth is an opinion. You want to be correct is the correct word. It's okay. like you, you, want to, you want to answer somebody. And how do you spell answer? A-N-F. So therefore, it's a. It means no contract. You want to correspond. C O. You have a community. C O. You have a country. C O. You have a court. C O. You have a communication. You see, a, a co-op, a county, a country. There, the the C O brings things together as corporate or contract. The constitution. When you get into the vowels, A, E, I, O, and U, you start a word with a vowel and it's used as a single letter. It means no contract. A single syllable means no contract. If you use a vowel and two consonants to start a word, it means no contract. We spent 8,000 hours and looked up every word in the, in the dictionaries and all the synonyms to verify that statement. And so since we've been advertising and for the past 14 years all these secrets and all these procedures the attorneys the lawyers and the judges have studied those so they are writing more perfect zero statement contract which say absolutely nothing because they are intentionally using an adverb uh, adverb verb Adverb, verb, adverb, verb statement, an adverb, adjective, pronoun, adverb, adjective, pronoun, adverb, adjective, pronoun, an adjective, pronoun, adjective, pronoun, a pronoun, adverb, verb, a pronoun, adverb, adjective, pronoun. See, there's a combination. There's only five combinations. And what they're doing is they're doing the repetitious. You can have a quick step, which is a one, two, one, two, one, two. You can have a country western two step, which is one three four, one three four, one three four. You can have rock and roll four one two, four one two, four one two <laughs> set off by commas. So they can when you look at the when you look at the writing, 
and actually is music. And the music in the head of one attorney or one lawyer writing the contract, when the music changes, it's because he's borrowing music from another attorney or another lawyer, what they call conclusionary law. So the individual who is writing, when the writing style changes, I know exactly who or what is is perpetrating a fraud here. The Yale uh, Law School, Marquette Law School, Harvard Law School, Princeton Law School, they all teach different mathematical patterns, which are their signatures. And when you're out syntaxing paperwork, it's very easy to identify when two or more individuals get together as a team and each one puts a little bit of their music into the style of writing. And so they, they're doing change-ups all the time and sometimes they make absolutely no sense whatsoever um, in their patterns. But the math doesn't lie. And, you know, you're, you're looking at that and you're pulling your hair out going like, that can't be, that can't be. But like Sherlock Holmes says, when you remove all the things that can't be, what are left are the facts. And and that's what we work from. The word a, Love the word an, and the word the are always adverbs. So if you look at those three words in a in a document that a lawyer wrote, and and you went down that whole thing, you would see that one third of all the words on the on the document are adverbs, which are modifiers. Well, when you modify the condition of a fact, that's perjury. That's a lie. And everyone, I don't care who you are, I don't care what language you speak, everyone has a definition for perjury. They know that's a crime. They know that's a lie. Now, let me let me clarify that. Now, you're modifying uh, the modifiers, and that makes perfect sense to me. But how are these, how, do, do these people know, can, can you, do they really, And because the publicly they're never going to admit this. I understand this. I've been doing this for a long time, and I understand that publicly they're not going to say a lot of things. They'll try to make you look crazy, but privately, do these people, and I know that you are, um, I got some of your information, and I, I, and I understand about the tort br uh, branch claim staff and all these different things. You want to speak on that a little bit? Are they really uh, recognizing this? Do they really understand what you're saying? Because no one can argue with math. No one can argue with math. And yes, if you've been properly they, educated they, in grammar, you know what you're saying is true. So what, you want to speak on that a little bit? Sure. When they, when you file a lawsuit and the government gets it and they want to keep things kind of quiet, what they'll do is they'll write a fiction lawsuit and they'll keep the factual lawsuit in one hand and the fiction in the other. And the, the individual will go ahead and walk into court and present this uh, factual lawsuit to the judge and to the prosecuting attorney. And the, they'll go ahead and argue and argue and argue and run up the bill. But then the individual, if he feels he's going to lose the fiction lawsuit, he says, excuse me, I have something else to show you. Here's the correct lawsuit written in syntax. Would you like me to present this and publish this, or would you like to settle on the fiction lawsuit? Immediately the trial is stopped, and they settle on the fiction lawsuit because they don't want to educate the public that they've been lying the entire time. Because it carries a $25 million fine and 30 years in prison. And therefore, it's a tort when two or more people come together as a fiduciary, the judge, attorney, a banker, like your mortgages, and create a fraudulent condition of state and sell somebody's home that they don't own and throw you out on the street. That's tort, and they're using false and misleading statements to do so. Now, I'll run, I'll run a scenario through you what happened. You want to buy a house. You go to the bank. The bank goes ahead, and all banks in the United States are not allowed to own property. They're not allowed to own homes. The only thing they're allowed to do is be a servicer. And as a servicer, they're going to uh, 
get, you're going to go to the bank and say, I want to borrow a house, borrow money. So the servicing bank goes to the treasury window with the mortgage that you signed. Mind you, the bank does not sign this document, only you do. Now, you think that it's a contract, but it's not a contract because it only has one signature on it. So therefore, it's an application to withdraw money from your account. So when that money is withdrawn from your account, it's put into the bank. Now, the bank has three days under Title 15, Section 1635A of the Rescission Act to go ahead and open an account up and put the, let's say, $500,000 in your account. So they put $500,000 into an account, and then because it's on a 30-day mortgage, they're going to be able to fraction that at 10 to 1, putting $5 million in that account. Now what they're going to do is take the $500,000 they just borrowed from, the, from your treasury, your Social Security account, and put the money immediately back within three days under the three-day rescission act so that there's no, nobody's looking to see if anything was legal or not. The paperwork, which was the mortgage that was supplied to the treasury window, the treasury window, the clerk, only has a second-grade reading level. And the mortgage was written in a second-grade reading level. So they don't understand both the clerk and the person borrowing the money that they've been lied to. The only thing the bank is doing here is extorting money from the treasury so they can put it into their bank and start fractioning it and earning interest on it. So the bank goes ahead and they put the money back. Treasury's all happy. And now it's just between you and the bank. The bank then says, well, you have to pay, make house payments to put the one-tenth of the money, the 500000 back in the bank to bring everything up to their $5 million. In the meantime, the $4.5 million that they have in their bank is being sold to MasterCard at 18 to 32% interest. And, you're make, and they're making $450,000 to $500,000 a year on your money. So in nine months, the entire 500000 in interest is paid back in, and they got their $5 million, at which time, they, all the, as, as fast as the interest comes in, it could be fractioned at 10 to 1, so it's an exponential compounding exercise. Now, the bank, all of a sudden, you can't make the house payment, so you stop paying. The bank is a servicer. What the bank did, as fast as they got the paper, came off the paper in three days, they took their mortgage and they bundled it with other mortgages that were fraudulently made, and they took that paper as a securitized-backed asset to Wall Street, and they sold it to unsuspecting investors who have a second-grade reading level with second-grade reading level documents that are 125% fraud. Because everybody went to school and were unsuspectingly dumbed down to a second-grade reading level. You graduated from 12th grade, but you still had a second-grade reading level. You went to college, and you graduated with a master's degree or a bachelor's degree, but you still have a second-grade reading level. You can say, see the ball. Pronoun, adverb, verb. He is a pronoun, does an adverb, making ball a verb. State of California. State is a pronoun, of an adverb, making California a verb. That's the second grade reading level. By the way, the word state of California is the name of the courthouse. It's not, you live in the California territory. The name of the courthouse is state of California. All 50 states. The name of the courthouse is, is state of and the name of the state. And these are foreign vessels and dry docks under under federal rules of civil procedure 44.1. All humans that live within the United States are actually foreign entities. So when you walk into the courthouse, you are a foreign vessel. You speak a foreign language. You write in a second grade reading level as a foreign language. And so the judge says, I can't see, I can't hear. We're going to call you a pro se. P-R-O means no, and the S-A is speak. You are a no-speak person. You have no contract. 
So while you're inside my courthouse, do you have semen papers to enter my ship, which is in dry dock? Do you have a contract or a bill of lading to be on my ship in dry dock? The answer is no. You have no correct paperwork. So therefore, you're trespassing. I don't care what you're in that courthouse for. The only thing that judge can see is he's got a vessel that is trespassing on his vessel. And they exercise trespass laws on you, and they fine you, and you'll pay anything to get out of their prison for trespassing, but they don't tell you they're trespassing. They'll call it something else, like contempt of court. So the individual... Go ahead. Let me interject. Let me interject real quick. I wanted I wanted to say this. I was in Miami and um I was locked up in Miami. And uh I saw the federal jail. I mean the federal courthouse there is a new courthouse in Miami. Do you know that they built I've it in this? A, yes, I've been I've been in it. It looks like a ship. Yeah, it built it just like a ship. <laughs> a ship in dry docks. I know what you're saying. I mean, they just said that they do things like that to us to just put and let you know you're walking on a ship. They built the whole courthouse like a boat. It's incredible. So you, you know, okay, you know I'm in Milwaukee, and next to Milwaukee is called a city called Waukesha. And the name of the street in front of the courthouse is called the USS Waukesha. <laughs> <laughs> And they give you these little messages and, you know, and let you know. Uh, a friend of mine was pointing out, he said, in, in California, all the courthouses on Temple Street. Like, there's some sort of temples and, you know, it's, it's you know, I thought it was Well, okay, easy. one of the four streets, one of the four streets that surround the courthouse will either be some terminology of all the things on a sailing ship. You can be on Water Street. You can be on Mass Street. You can be on State yeah. Street. You can be yeah. on on Starboard <laughs> Street or Aft Street. Um, you know, it's always something to do with water, right? Or even the, even the DTC Fifty Five Water Street. I mean, right? They're letting you know, right? They're advertising the fact that it's a vessel in dry dock, and the vessels in dry dock are controlled by the port authorities, and the port authorities are controlled by the DOT Department of Transportation, which is owned by the post office. The post office makes the money and owns the treasury. The treasury is is an arm of uh, of our government, and the government is the post office. Now, very few people know that the United States of America ended on November 2nd, 1999, and for 90 days we did not elect a president. Well, there's also a one-year rescission, I mean a rent, uh, a one-year moratorium under salvage claim under Title 46, Chapter 781. So we have November 2nd, 1999. One year later, it's November 2nd, 2000, presidential election. Did we elect the president? The answer is no. We had to wait 90 days. And for 90 days, they had Iowa and, and Florida recounting their ballots and kept everybody busy on the recount for 90 days. And on the 2nd of February, exactly 90 days later, because no law is legal in federal law for 90 days, Bush is appointed as the 43rd president of the United States. And then the United States, he became president of the United States of America Corporation, the Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Independence, and the Constitution of the United States, all written in the second grade reading level in adverb, verb, and all null and void. The first thing we have to do is bring down the World Trade Center and scare people enough to suspend all your constitutional rights because people are afraid that this is a terrorist attack. And that the, 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 ang- the world is angry with America. So they go ahead and they take away our rights and now we've got to go through all this hoopla okay. over at the at the airport. <laughs> okay, now I want to I want to interject real quick because you said I want to back up because you brought up the post office and I got some people hitting me with questions and even okay. I have a question on this myself. It's um, you know, back about three years ago I first came across your information and it was kind of confusing at first. I was, but I would see you all over the place on the internet. Everybody knows who you are, but. I also noticed that people would put these stamps on their documents. Everybody would say, well, put a stamp on it, put a stamp on it. Um, 
And so what I, I'm not the type of person, I just don't like to do things because somebody tells me to do it. So I started investigating the use of stamps, and I came across a document on the Internet. Uh, it's entitled The Significance of Stamps Used on Banknotes, and it's by this Dr. Arnold Keller of Ber Berlin, Germany. But it's a very good document. It's about 27 pages, and he shows me how these stamps have been used on negotiable instruments for a very long time. This is not anything. I, I wanted to get yeah. your take on why you use uh, uh, put dollar stamps on documents on the front and back, and you you know, you, can you just explain that real quick? Somebody wanted to know about that. Okay, a dollar is a whole number. You can't use fractions. Fractions don't count, but when you want to be official, you want to use a whole number. Now, the weight of our uh, one lawsuit weighs about one pound worth of paper, and one pound worth of paper would command a $1 transportation fee to for you to take the document as a letter carrier from your home to the courthouse. And because you sign your name across the stamp, it makes you a postmaster, delivering the mail to the port of the court. Now, the stamp on the vessel, the vessel is the court. The vessel is a closed area. Because you're going to dock your vessel, you have to pay a docking fee. Therefore, you get a docking number or a docket, D-O-C-K-E-T, docket number. If you get your docket number and you pay your fee, now you have a document. Now you know where the three words come from. Doc, docking, docket, docket, document. It's all about a maritime vessel coming to the port of the court and then being docked or registered. So once it's been registered, you have a, because you put a stamp on the paper, it is now an Article Three maritime Equity court. Now your your uh, document has to have it, the independence of its existence. It must have a constitution. It must have authorization to dock. It must have a definition. Must have a dictionary. It must have a cause of action. You must ask for a some form of a reward or damage to explain why you're coming to court for a settlement. Like when you bring your mortgage contract, which has 4,000 uh, 4, mistakes in grammar and about another 1,000 mistakes in no contract words. So when you take, so it comes to about 5,000 mistakes on a mortgage document. And you bring that to court and the judge, the, the bank never signed it, right? But the yep. bank or an attorney for the bank has to hold that document up and say, I want to use this fraudulent document to take that person's house, and that becomes a signed confession. And once that document is a signed confession and is presented as evidence to take something, but it's fraudulent, now you have your conspiracy, you have your tort, you have your racketeering to reduce somebody else with a false document. And that now becomes a $25 million fine and 30 years in prison. And that's why when this, when I first came out and started process pro, uh, filing lawsuits against the fraudulent conveyance of grammar, the banks all over the United States had their mortgages frozen by the respected state because the state and the district attorney's office and the attorney general looked at the paperwork and said, this is legitimate, we've got to freeze freeze everything and figure out what we're going to do here. Then Lloyds of London got a hold of it on November 6, 2010 and canceled all 64 million title insurance policies and for, a, for, a prep, for the judge to say, well, I can't read that. That doesn't mean anything. And Lloyds of London says, I'm not going to invest my money or insure a fraudulent document. And then Securities and Exchange Commission on September 4th 2010, which is four weeks later after, or to follow suit with the securities, uh, with uh, Lloyds of London, says we're bringing a $400 billion lawsuit against the banks for filing false and misleading bank documents 
which are mortgage documents under securitized backed assets, and they've collected their $400 billion, and that was only 1% of the $400 trillion that is available to the Treasury to collect from the bank. From And then, then under the Clayton Act, they can do $100 million per house at the Securities and Exchange and $100 million per house at the Department of Justice. But the bank stole $7,000 trillion from the United States Treasury. So paying a $400 trillion fine is not a big deal for the bank. Okay, let me let me interject now because I'm getting questions rolling in. We're going to take some, uh, if it's okay with you, i got a lot of people with their hands up that want to ask you <coughs> some questions. we got about an hour ahead. left. We got about an hour left on the show, and got twelve minutes left on the stream. I want to tell everybody um, if you want to. I got David Windmiller on the line. You want to ask him some questions? The call in number is four two four two 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 fifty two fifty. We got about ten minutes left on the internet stream. So everybody in the chat room, if you want to uh, uh, continue listening to the show, you're gonna to have to call in, or you're gonna Skype in. You can Skype in as well. But I have a question. Uh, is there a significance with the fingerprint and also the registered mail? It is registered mail, what is the difference between registered and certified mail, and is there some type of appreciable difference? Yes. When you have a, when you do certified mail, that's a green card return receipt. That's what the, the courts require to certify the fact that you communicated to the bank and you have a, or to the government that you have a receipt for the mailing that you did. A registered mail is that we register our lawsuit with the post office because the lawsuit is a vessel. Before the vessel goes to the port of the court, that we're going to register the vessel to transport it so that the identity of our vessel has been certain, has been registered with the post office. After all, we put a postage stamp on the paper, we put a and we put a registered mail sticker on the envelope. So we are we are both certified and registered before we even walk into a foreign vessel and dry dock. Because the only reason that that, that courthouse is allowed to exist in the port as is under the jurisdiction of the port authority, and that's to listen to grievances from we the people from the people of America. Now, if the courthouse, if the courthouse does not allow the filing of a document, well, then they have violated their charter to be in America at the courthouse, and they have to close their doors. Judges have to quit. The attorneys get fired, and they're no longer an issue, and they have to leave the country. You know, a unique thing happened out here in Hawaii on March eighth. 2013, Hawaii became sovereign because they came out of their 70-year international bankruptcy. Three days after that took place, the historical post office that was built 109 years ago in downtown Waialuku was raised, torn down, and now it's a parking lot. Wow. Million and a wow. half dollar building in perfect condition torn down and turned into a parking lot. When we filed the Constitution of Hawaii on March 6th, um, on January 6, 2008, three days later, every offshore bank worldwide left Hawaii. We have no offshore banking in Hawaii. We are an independent island state, and the banks are controlled by the post office. So the post office knew they got caught in a lie, and the banking had to leave. Grammar is yeah. the most parse syntax grammar is the most powerful tool on planet Earth. Wow. Okay, well okay, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna take a few phone calls now. I got a lot of people got some questions. Um that okay with you? Yes, go ahead. All right, let me bring in our first call, a lady Fairfax. You're on high frequency radio. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. 
trying to see my caller. Okay, they didn't get Sorry, to hear sorry. Me. I had my I was muted and I was trying to get something dropped into your Skype. Sorry. Oh, okay. Go ahead. <laughs> that was pertinent. Um I dropped a, a article from a couple of days ago out of New York Times that mentions David Wynn Miller and I thought maybe he'd like to know. <laughs> I heard about it. Yes, I did. Okay, I figured maybe you might have, but I just thought I'd let you know in case. And um uh, one other thing, um, I don't have the doc right in front of me, but uh, we f I was reading, I guess it was the Federal Registry, when um, the Postal Department was completely given over to the Treasury Department, so I, or the, at least the assets of it. So The you know, Post Office controls the Treasury, yes. Who's on a $100 bill? Right, Benjamin right. Franklin, first Postmaster General of the United States. Well, I mean, I mean, the, the Postal Department, not the U.S. Postal Service, the remnants of the Postal Department and all of the postal banking and savings um, uh, were rolled into no, the Treasury. Right, because the 2nd of September 2010, the Universal Postal Union in Bern, Switzerland, was identified to have never written a correct parse syntax grammar treaty trust or contract anywhere on planet Earth since 1800. The United States Postal uh, Service has a bank treaty and a postal treaty written in quantum grammar by Russell Gould and myself and served on them back in 2000. And so the United States Postal Service realizes that they have the only correct parse syntax grammar postal treaty and banking treaties and therefore took over the UPU, becoming the center of the post office worldwide. And so they are in charge of our treasury here. And because the New York Stock Exchange trades in dollars and other currencies worldwide, they're using the grammar as a back as a backstop to certify the position of the correctness of their international treaties for international banking and international stock trades. Okay, that, I just wanted to ask you about that. Thank you. All right. Did did You're you want to did you want to respond to this New York? I ain't read this New York Times thing, but I'm gonna go read it. But how, how do you want to respond to your detractors? Do you want to say? Well, first anything? Off, I, I put it in. Count. I put it in your Skype account. Okay. The because I know are the the like Wikipedia. Every single article that Wikipedia put up there is misinformation because. They're, they misspell my name. The, they create fictitious case numbers that are not my case numbers. They file the document in the United States District Court, which we do not do because United means no citizen. I have no citizen condition of state. District means demon god of the underworld for trickery. D-I-S is demon god. You can look it up in, in, in the dictionary. And trickery is T-R-I-C-T. And then you have the last thing, court, which is a closed area. So you have a no condition, uh, no citizen state, demon battle of the underworld trickery in a closed area called court. So we have the document contract, federal postal station court venue. And it's venue because a venue comes from the location of Earth. The word jurisdiction means opinion because J-U means no law. And every time you use no parking or no trespassing or don't walk, you're using a negative condition of a word. Just like I said, a vowel as a syllable means no but, uh, to start a word. A vowel to consonants means no contract. If you're going to put no contract word in every single sentence, anything you multiply times, a ne times zero equals zero. So the government has created an entire condition of zero communications worldwide in 5,000 languages. That's 150 yeah. popular languages, but the judges and the attorneys and the lawyers on a worldwide basis, even all religions worldwide, use negative language. And why are you using negative language? Well, Even the Tenth really Amendment says, thou shall not. 
Why doesn't it say thou shalt perform? Well, thou shalt be positive. Thou shalt love. You know, use positive statements, not negative statements. People will really have to understand grammar, because I, I understand exactly. You're 100% correct, and I've dealt with these people, and I know how they will. You know, 70% of the people believe everything they, they see in the media. You know, that's the thing. Yeah. So, you I know. know. Uh, you know, so you, you're dealing with that, and they know, and they know that as well. So, you know, those of us who dealt with these people, we, you know, we know and we understand what is going on. But let me let me bring in another um, caller real quick. I got a whole bunch of people. Thank you, Lady Fairfax. Okay. And uh, let me bring in another call. I got a lot of people with their hands. I'm going to run up to uh, try to get to as many of these calls as I can. Seven one four four three four zero three four. You're on high frequency radio. Peace to the gods. Peace, peace to the gods. What's going on? Uh, I'm good. I'm blessed. Man, this is you, you really popped a surprise on us today, you, sir. <laughs> <Thank> you. <laughs> uh, uh, David Windmiller, how you doing, man? I've studied you for um, I've studied your material, uh, and uh, I like it. I like it. But um, if 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 you don't mind, um, I had a DVD by this. Uh, one of the one of these cats he claimed to be one of your students, and uh, his name is uh, Yahshua L. And he made a claim that you had died. You know, and we like you know the it, it was taped at an audience or whatever. And then you know myself, I'm looking at it, and and the guy called you a fraud. Have you ever you ever heard of this guy? Well, what's uh, his name? Yahshua L. I have a clip I could even play it. You know, we everybody's like, oh, my God. And okay. That, and then, when, oh, yeah. He's talking about when I was 25 years old, I died. Yes, I was in a morgue for 35 minutes with my, after they removed my right kidney and took out both adrenal glands. I went into anesthesia shock, and I I had my, uh, my, I was legally dead and had a death certificate signed. My heart was hanging out of my chest, and it started beating after 35 minutes. And I was, uh, it took them 11 and a half hours to put me back together, and I am who I am today. <laughs> and so, if you, if you look at, look at this. My website is the only website worldwide like it. There is no plagiarizing. There is not another website in quantum language out of 3 billion websites worldwide. It's a very unique concept. True indeed. So, what, you know, I just, I just, I just, man, I just have to, like, clear up the air because, I mean, I'm talking to you live. You know what I mean? And I'm like, uh, I asked the guy who gave me the DVD about the question, and he's just kind of, you know, he didn't really address it. It wasn't the, the guy that made the accusation, but it was the guy who I got the DVD from. Well, obviously, he's incorrect because you're talking to the man live right now. And um, right. that's what I'm saying about listening to certain people. You know, find things. Believe nothing. Find out things for yourself. True indeed. True indeed. Okay. Do, do, would you, do you want to hear the clip or no, you wouldn't care to hear that? That's, that's up to that's you. Okay. That's fine. That's, that's okay. We don't have to play. You know you're right here. So, right. if you forward the clip, I, I got to take well, I mean, it has, it has, it has a lot. It just, it just, you know, like these, these are live parties, so I'd like to clear the air. You know, it's myself, not the, you know, I mean, it's good right. for all of the people and stuff. But, I mean, I want to be clear of myself. So, when I go purchase material, you know, I won't be, you know, I don't want to be caught up in a, fraud either. You know what I mean? I don't want to just be buying material from somebody and it, it really doesn't hold any weight. You know what I'm saying? Right. Oh, right. This, my my website and the material, there's 400 pages on the website and like 200 hours of free videos up on the internet that you can watch. And that is so true. Not for, not for and you, after, after not you've for seen you, that, it will open your eyes up. Not from you. I've learned a lot from you. I just don't, you know, this, this, uh, the party who I received it from, I, I hold him in an esteem. So to get, a, you know, a product from this individual, 
that has this kind of, you know, anybody can say anything. You know, I'm just clearing up the air for me. You know what I mean? Okay. Right. Okay. Well, you, well, you pretty much, I'm not going to slam nobody on the air. I'm, I'm not going to do that. But as you can see, you're speaking to him now. He's not dead. And um, right. uh, he does he does have a lot of material. That's what I did. I had to watch his videos over and over and over again. And uh, it just made sense to me, you know. And that made sort of doing research. So, you know. Uh, let's, hey, right. let's put it this way. The world of adverb verb liars are going to do everything in their power to protect 8,500 years of lies. And now we have, I did campaign Pandora when I opened the door on mathematics and, and broke the code between math and grammar. And it's synonymous with all the different languages worldwide. That's why my website can be translated without translation deviation between one culture and another culture. There hasn't been anyone in the history of mankind or written language that has done, accomplished this. And I've been at this for 33 years with 80,000 hours of background. Okay. Hey, let me, let me break. Okay, I appreciate I'll you guys, man. Okay, appreciate man. Thank you, man. And appreciate you. Thank you. Take care, you guys. Thank you. All right, let me bring in another call real quick. Uh, 412 uh, you're on High Frequency Radio. Got a uh, question for David Wimmel? Hey. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes I, can. I can. hear you. Go ahead. Okay. David, how you doing? It's a pleasure hearing from you. I'm doing me. fine. I was quite interested when, um, I guess it was a video that you had, and you um, said you went in and you uh, went to arrest uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist. Yes, Is that Rehnquist. Right? We're friends. I said, was that factual? You went in there to arrest him. I think it was a video that you had. I was real curious about no, that. No, we did, we did not arrest William Rehnquist or any judges. What we did is we showed that the judges have never issued an order in the history of the United States Supreme Court that the judges did not have a correct parse syntax, grammar, oath of office. The judges did not have a C-pass. S E E, a C treaty, S E A, or a drogue law, D R O G U E, to anchor the United States Supreme Court building on planet Earth. Therefore, therefore, they were an alien vessel in dry dock, speaking babble and writing babble, and using the certiorari as a cover story, which means they never have to make a decision and they can do things at their own discretion. By you volunteering to accept certiorari instead of a complaint or a contract, you accept an opinion, and an opinion O is a single vowel, which means no connecting contract. So an opinion has no value. So if the highest court in the land is issuing no contract value, then what are we having? It's a bunch of nonsense. I'm trying to My bring the is... Rankwood and, and, and three other judges walked off the bench and resigned. Congress met in the emergency session, and the law says seven of nine must always be seated, and two had to go back. Rankwood and Day walked and never went back. Rankwood died six weeks later. The and O'Connor Day was put back on the on the bench a year later when they couldn't find another female judge with qualifications to take take her position. And that's that we've left it alone since nineteen uh since two thousand and five when this happened. Okay, what did you say your okay, question you, was? Go ahead. You talking to me or you talking to me yeah, or David? You, you. What was your question? I was just I was just curious at how he uh, went in there and uh, asked to speak with him, and uh, you know he just walked up there, and uh, I was just want to know uh, exactly how that went because I seen the video, and 
he came down there. No, okay, they just I'll started... explain it to you. What we did was we went and stood in front of the Supreme Court building with an American, a 1 to 1.9 American flag, and we held court on the sidewalk, which is public domain, the vessel starts with the first step of the Supreme Court. Twelve marshals came out of the building and stood on the step in front of our court. And one of the marshals lost his balance. And as he stepped on the sidewalk, the three of our, the three judges, Russell Gould, Janice Logan, and myself, pointed to him and say, we identify you as a uh, stand to attention as our tip staff, which is our marshal. And when we said that, he immediately walked over and we made him hold the flag for us while we conducted our two-hour court session, read the charges, showed the forensic evidence, signed across our stamps and put our seals on it. And then the Supreme Court judges were watching us on television in chambers the Supreme Court met, and uh, the, the nine judges took their bench, uh, took their their benches, and uh, we handed our paperwork to the to the marshal, who was uh, our chief staff, and he carried that into the clerk's office. We stood on the on the front steps. The judges looked at our paperwork, and then they invited us in for discussion. And in that discussion, in front of the judges, we explained that we, as three judges, are federal because we signed the stamps, that there, the nine judges that sat before us were on a different plane. We could not see or hear them. They were speaking in adverb verb, and therefore they were babbling. We told them they did not have an oath of office, and they needed to upgrade their their appearance to be on a level plane with the audience when they conduct court, that they need to have an oath written with the correct parse syntax grammar and have a new charter that is certified in the correct parse syntax grammar to operate the Supreme Court. And then we left, and that was the end of it. Two days later, four of the nine judges resigned and walked off the bench. No one in the history of the United States has ever removed judges because of mathematical, math grammar interface. So we we made our point. We were gracious. We were only there as plenipotentiaries to educate and to show that we, as the people who are judges, and we filed our oaths, and they were accepted at the United States Supreme Court in Washington, D.C., but we have quantum oaths. Then they need to duplicate our quantum oaths to have a quantumized claim of the live life, not a birth certificate, which means birth debit. Not to be called a non dead person with uppercase spelling of your name to actually be a living entity and conduct themselves in a living manner with other people. So when we explained our position, the position was then respected. We weren't, we were not rude, we were polite and educational, and we left. Oh, okay, and well, like I said, I'm, well, I'm really impressed with that because, uh, I mean, you get the Supreme Court Justice has been listening to you, and it's just hard for the layman to go into court and uh, get these judges to listen to us. Cause a lot of times when you, you know, uh, challenge them or anything, they say you need a mental evaluation, and they want to put you in handcuffs. So um, that's the only question I had wanted to ask, and um, I was impressed uh, from what I've seen from your video. All right. Now, the reason that they try to use the psychiatric argument is because there are no laws, rules, regulations, or codes written in correct grammar to arrest you. So they immediately say, well, then you must be, uh, there must be something mentally wrong with you if you think you understand what correct is. And the only thing you asked the judge was to be correct. But if he admits that he has lied in the 100,000 other cases that he has heard in 30 years on the bench, 
Well, he has to go back and vacate all those all those ju- all those judgments because it was false and misleading, fictitious conveyance of grammar, deprivation of rights under coloring of the law. And when you you have so many criminal activities taking place, it's somewhat embarrassing. You're supposed to be the person that make ha- has a clear mind and make good judgment about the decision. You know, you have to look at the case in front of you. What is the volition of the individual? Sometimes there are conditions of, of performance based on your volition. There are no laws to, to govern your conduct, but there is a common sense that goes with volition that judges look at the individual. If you're, if you're speeding 60 miles an hour in a school zone, I don't care what the law says, the general public will look at you endangered the safety of our children, so we're going to lock you up. If you drive drunk, you endanger everyone because you are not mentally competent to operate a piece of machinery that weighs two tons at high speed going at another vehicle over 100 miles an hour, you're going to kill somebody, including yourself. So these are public safety issues. And when you violate public safety, you will be locked up or taken out of circulation. Okay. Well, that's all that question I had. Like I said, I appreciate talking to you, and I'll let somebody else get on the phone, but uh, it's a pleasure talking to you. Thank you for your time. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Moving right along. 718-0885, you're on high frequency radio. Oh, Hello? Yes, you're on the air. Hi, hey, how you doing? Great, Good. great. How are you? All right. Um, I'm actually calling because um, I um, got the request for the Dropbox, and I just was wondering how long do I have access to it, and or, am I able to download it all at once, or... You know, you can download it all at once. But hit me on the um, hit me on the on the Skype with that question. We got a special okay. guest on the air, and um, okay. But you got access to it as long as you want to. Okay. Oh, okay. All right then. Thank you. All right. You're welcome. All right. Nine one seven ten twenty four. You're on high frequency radio. Peace, brother. Peace to the peace, special peace. guest. Peace. Um, I came in on the you know tail end, but uh, my when I chimed in, it was about the stamps and the second and the consumer instruments. Um, it's a pleasure to meet you. What exactly is your name, sir? So I can start looking into your material. Say that again, please. What exactly is your name, so I can start looking into your material? Oh, it's Paul Colin David Hyphen Win W Y N N Paul Colin. Space Miller, M I L L E R, David Wynn Miller. Okay. All right, because I know I, before I came across um, the gentleman who supposed to deal with the syntax and so forth, and uh, for what I understand, what all the contracts were supposed to have been null and void and so forth. Um, but in reference to the negotiable instruments, the signing through the stamp, could I view stamps for, you know, promissory notes and so forth? Um, so could you elaborate a little bit more on that? Because, you know, I want to explore that a little stamps, bit more. Stamps are supposed to be used on every single negotiable instrument, mortgages, automobile. Okay, when you go so what's equitable, bank, per- anything to have equity? Per- stamps come in many different forms. You can buy independent stick-on postage stamps, or they use mechanical ink stamps, right. but they have registered numbers on them. They, and whenever a stamp is used and it is canceled, you sign through it. Whoever signs the stamp is a postmaster. Okay, so I could use that on any contract. It's not just that's correct. Right. You can use it. You can put stamps on anything and make it. It becomes a a maritime postal vessel that the fee has been paid for. The Treaty of October October 22, 1871, guaranteed delivery of mail for two cents anywhere in the world. That has never been changed. Right. 
Um, it was also my understanding by putting the one dollar stamp on there. Um, that also makes it like a national, um, you know, negotiable instrument because it shows the country, the origin, and the domination. Like you said, the constitution and so forth. Is there any validity to that? Yeah, the the stamp brings you under the maritime <clears throat> maritime postage. You paid the fee to transport the vessel. Now, you're familiar with the terminology 12-21-2012, December 21st, 2012, Mayan calendar, end of the world. Okay. We, at 9 a.m. in the morning, Russell J. Gould and David Wynn Miller walked into the Benjamin Franklin, July 4th, 1775, Federal Postal Court in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and ordered the court open, filing two oath of offices in quantum language and a new postal, a new federal postal court charter to open the court up, and that certified that we were ending the world of verb with court and had a quantum charter to now operate federal postal courts with the correct parse syntax grammar. And okay, so excellent. right after that took place, the, can, we served the Canadian government the because Benjamin Franklin was Postmaster General of Canada in 1873 as well as the United States, but opened the court on July 4, 1775. So the... Canadian government has issued a Benjamin Franklin $1 stamp to honor the 250th anniversary of his postmaster's position between Canada and the for all of North America in 1773. And we trumped the United States court system because they weren't formulated until 1899 by 24 years. So this is this is unique because under Title 42, 1986, we had knowledge of a crime, and we authorized we had authority to stop and correct it. So we stopped and correct the fictitious conveyance of language. We ordered open the federal postal court with the correct parse syntax grammar, so there would be no misunderstanding as to the volition of our position. Excellent. All right. I remember you said something in reference to um, federal district court. We don't even do that, right? Is that what you said before? Well, first off, it, when you're using the word federal and district in the same terminology, that would be federal trickery or demon god of the underworld for trickery. We don't. We're not right. a district. I'm not a district court judge. I'm a federal postal judge. Okay. So if I want to file a federal uh, claim, which court or where would I go to? Uh, say that again, you broke up. Excuse me? He said he said, if you, wanted, he he said if you wanted to what he said was if he wanted to file a federal claim, where would he do it at? Where would he go to? Well a federal claim would go to a federal if you use the United States District Court to file your claim or you go to the Washington DC at the Federal Claims Office. You can get that information off the internet. So it would have to be the U.S. District Court then? Or the Federal Court of, Fed, uh, the, the court of Federal Claims in Washington, D.C. Okay. If you have some claim against the United States. Um, well, it's like it's against the state, like a deprivation of rights under the color of law. Deprivation of rights under color of law is titled 18, Section 242. Right, but I want to do it under 42, Title 42. Of 18, for what I understand. Um, Title 42, 1986 is knowledge of a fraud and the right to stop and correct it. Title 42, 1985, subsection 1 is conspiracy. Subsection 2 is obstructing evidence and witnesses through modification of grammar. And subsection 3 is depriving evidence and witnesses through, the, through uh, modification of grammar to reduce you beyond a point of recovery, which goes to a Title 18, 1961 racketeering. Carries a 30-year prison right. sentence. Okay, well, I think that's right. what I need to do, because it was a conspiracy. Okay, well, I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to let somebody else get in, and I'm going to start looking into your material. All right, very good. Have a good day. Keep up the good work. Keep up the excellent work.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Boy, everybody will get in today. Let me get uh four four three oh eight six two you on high frequency radio. Peace, Namaste, what's going on? Peace, peace, what's going on? Um, this is Miguel Mario Bay. I had a question for the guest. Um, as far as because um I'm studying grammar a lot and I, I would love to get the right direction. I haven't seen um your site, um with Wim Miller, but uh so uh apologies if I'm asking the question that could be answered on the website. But um, I had seen a few years back a video on uh, Barack Obama when he gave his, his speech um, where he said, yes, we can, about 30-something uh, times. So I'm, I'm asking because you're saying the syntax grammar has a numerical representation. I mean, it has a nu- numerical aspect to it to where we're speaking grammar in a proper way. I'm asking, is that the reason why if you take that same video and play it in reverse, where he's saying, yes, we can, it actually says, thank you, Satan. To where, you know, like in Arabic, they say you if you you can read it right to left or left to right, and it says exactly the same thing. Does that have a, does that, why certain things like that happen? When you write a sentence and you understand the that you use the opposite preposition to read the sentence backwards, then you can certify the value of the sentence both frontwards and backwards. That and that's what gives you the power. When you write a sentence in adverb verb from left to right, you can't read it backwards because there's no prepositions to so use the opposite preposition. So therefore the sentence is a lie. You can write let's put give it to you this way. You had a sentence that had thirty three prepositional phrases, one hundred words. And you put one adverb verb anywhere in the sentence, frontwards and backwards, it would read adverb, adjective, pronoun 33 times with one adverb verb. And you would have no prepositional phrases. Because any fact times a lie is a lie, and all numbers multiplied times zero, no matter how big they are, is zero. What is like a, a um, okay? So I, I'm because I, I love to have like principles by which I go. You know, while I'm learning anything, I have just the rules of thumb. Like I, I know, I keep hearing in um, you know, law they have a rule of seventy-two. Uh, it's a rule of seventy-two. In finances, I heard you say it, it's a rule of seven, which is compound interest. And um, you know how long it'll take a dollar to turn into two dollars just off interest. So what are, what are some quick uh, principles as far as grammar is concerned. Um, that's that's on a second grade reading level that we can grasp at this point. Because I hear what you're saying, but I'm trying to visualize it as, as well. I know what you're saying, but I'm, what, how do you apply what you're saying from where we uh, are? Well, well I, I'll put it together in a real simple. Uh, if you you know a pen, P E N is pen. Mm. Pen by itself is a pronoun. If you put a in front of it, or the, or any preposition or article in front of the word pen, the pen, a pen, for pen, with pen, it, the, those all adverbs, all prepositions and articles become adverbs. Adverbs modify, modify is change, change is motion, motion is action, and action is verb. Therefore, the makes the pen into a verb. There's no such thing as a pen, a pen verb. Now, if you put the prepositional phrase in front of it for the pen, now you have a preposition article and a noun. You have a, if I go with your pen, with my pen, with her pen, with his pen, with the pen, every time I I change the, the lodial or ownership, I change the definition of the word pen, I can do that. And if I say uh, for the pen, of the pen, by the pen, of the pen, over the pen, under the pen. I change the preposition, I change the value of the pen again. So we can do that 900 times. Because 64, uh, actually you have uh, 60 prepositions and 38 articles, and that comes to 2,400, but you have 1,200 different variables, but we only use 900 of them. 
So that's why I say there's 900 definitions for each word. And it's just about how you want to formulate your preposition or articles to make to certify the value of your fact. If you go, if you go to his, if you go to his website, because I know when I first started look, look, looking at his material, it's kind of confusing to me because it's strange and it's something that you're not used to. But it's like I start investigating and you get to, like they got an area, they got this thing called object, which is like a numerology and it's like kind of a mathematical interface with the languages in Arabic and. You start to see everywhere on the planet there's this kind of like this mathematical number letter relationship all over the planet. And when I saw his material and I broke down the parts of speech, I mean, I just knew it was the truth because I already had a big background in esoteric information and things like that. And it and you can't and anything that's mathematical is precise. Um, I've read documented even. If you structure your sentences, they be spoken correctly. Uh, to have, because everything has cause and effect, and for them to have proper effect, they have to be structured uh, properly. And it seems weird, at least this is just my opinion, it seems strange because we've been taught, like he says, to read on a second grade level. And we don't really understand how much we've been dumbed down. Everybody we deal with has been dumbed down. Everybody. Would that be a, a good assessment, David? Uh, oh, I'm here. Oh, yeah, I was just saying you a pretty assessment. You're breaking up really bad. You're breaking up a oh. lot. Of you. Oh, sorry. Hold on. All right. Can y'all hear me now? One more. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Just one, just one more question. Um, you had mentioned the post. Is it necessary to actually write a letter to the postmaster uh, firing him? Necessary, you know. Once you, because I've done what you said. I've done that process. I was taught that. I didn't know where it came from. Um, I didn't know how far back it came from. But I understand it in concept because you know we're dealing with apparality, so I use the stamp. Um, I don't know how you rate success, but I got what I thought I should get out of it. Um, and them honoring it when they're doing uh, no pro se, um, but you know refuse to execute. So is that um, is it necessary to actually write a letter to, letter to fire the postmaster general? No. Or just postmaster general has this program. He's fully aware of what what's going on. We we intend we have. Uh, when we file our bank treaties and our postal treaties worldwide, we always send copies to the government so that they are fully aware of everything that's happening as fast as, as it happens. And if any time the government wants to know something from me, they don't have to play games. They can just come right out and ask it, and we'll give them whatever information that they need. Okay. Uh, well, that was my question. I uh, appreciate it. I'm, I'm tight now. I'm looking looking through what I'm, I'm heavily confused, but I'm uh, I know how to read, so I'm, um, I appreciate it. I'm really enjoying this process because I'm I've just committed to studying um, grammar, etymology books, and everything. You, what what uh, if I um I may be jumping, I may be on here, um, but what do you recommend getting um, when you as we you know going into and learning uh, syntax uh, grammar a little bit more. Well, get on my website. My website, yeah, now. Web, my website is the only website that explains grammar in its in its mathematical procedure. Okay. So, all right. What is your website today? Website is dwmlc.com. When you type in my name, my website will come up whenever you type in my name on the Internet. There's okay. 50 billion linked websites to my website on the Internet. So yeah, I'm on it. I'm at it now. I'm seeing There's 22 right. carriers out there. And when you add them all up, it comes to about 5 billion people. All right. Okay.
Okay. All right. I appreciate All right. it. Appreciate it. I'm getting there at the caller. You are got it. Um, trying to get the people in waiting the longest. 278 on High Freak Radio. 267. Peace, brother. Is that me? Yes, it is. Peace. I want to. Islam, yes. Um, you're really, really breaking up. Uh, if I'm so excited that um, David Lynn Miller is on your show. I did see a piece on him once. I've been trying to find him on the Internet, but I thought it was David Wayne Miller, not Wynn Miller. So maybe that was my problem. Okay, if you could repeat your website a little slower so I can write it down, please. It's a D as in David, W as in Wynn, W-Y-N-N, M as in Miller, L as in language, and C as in communications.com. Okay, that's simple enough. Thank you. Thank you so much. But, yes, keep up the good work. It's good to hear you on Yousef's show. Thank you so much. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, I don't know who this is. You don't have frequency. Lock that number. Islam, Islam. Brother Yusuf, this is uh, Will I Am, California. Uh, greetings to the guests. My question is this. Um, is I kind of heard you earlier. I was one. I wanted to ask: Are you saying the UPU is not relevant anymore? The Universal Postal Union was taken. They still are relevant, but they've been taken over by the United States Postal Service, which has a quantum contract for postal. So, we would address, you know or uh, direct things to the UPU, so we would direct it, instead of them, we would direct it to the ni- United States Postal Service now? Yes. Oh, okay, I see. And as far as uh, with the stamps, I know the the, the, the $1 stamp is is uh, is probably the, the most significant one you want to use, but as far as, what about as far as like the $0.03 cents or the $0.02 cents stamp, are the Red Fox stamp, those stamps are, you can also continue to use those too, right? Yeah, Red, Red Fox stamps are going for like between 7 and $10 on the Internet because those were gold stamps. They have a two bars through the through the dollar sign, not one bar. Mm-hmm. They just came out with a new world stamp. It's a dollar ten cents. It's a forever stamp by the post office. Okay, and one more. As far as the uh, Constitution, I mean, who was that Constitution written for? And, like, if I go up into, you know, a courthouse, is it different from someone, uh, I guess I would say someone of color using that than, you know, a European using that? There's no difference. All courthouses worldwide function on the same same fundamental rules. They're a vessel in dry dock, and all people who enter a courthouse are foreign vessels speaking a foreign language. And they say, well, you've got to be a licensed attorney or a licensed uh, lawyer. Well, an attorney says you're incompetent, and right. the the bar association is no more than the Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts. It's a private club. Right, right. A private a private club that functions on a foreign vessel. And if the, all courthouses on planet Earth are foreign vessels, they are not part of Earth. So when you walk into a courthouse, you've left your planet, you've left your state, you've left your country, and now you're in a... The land of Oz. Foreign That's country. right. It made the Wizard of Oz and Alice in the Looking Glass because all things in the world of the courts are backwards. So can you, I guess I'll say, honestly tell me that they are looking 
at each individual, whoever it is, that walk in that, into that courtroom uh, same, the same. Yeah, what they're doing is they're looking at you as a, somebody to harvest. Right. Because bankers are judges, and judges are bankers, and they're just there to harvest. How much money, you know, the, the, the American court system and prison system is the world's largest corporation, bigger than all the stocks in the New York Stock Exchange combined. Mm-hmm. They have three, three, uh, excuse me, 30 million people on probation paying money to them, and 5 million people behind bars, which are danger to public safety. That's about 14% of the population of America is under arrest. Ooh. Wow, yeah, that's... I mean, this is this is just amazing. I mean, it's like... Uh, I get what you're saying now. It's like something else that, you know, us that that are involved in this, we have to try to, you know, understand the syntax of language and all of that. You know, I knew it was some kind of language also involved that... You know, when you're writing something, you're actually spelling something. You're putting a spell out there, and uh, it needs to be proper and correct in your way of doing it. Because of so not this, uh, the word proper, P R O means no, and P E R is person, no mm-hmm. person. So it, A means no speak. Justice, J U means no law. <clears throat> S is speak, T I is title, and T E is judge, and it's written backwards. Judge title speaks no law. See what I mean? <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm talking about. You need to have, you have to know this stuff. I mean, that's, so that's, when that's, you want to go in the court and say, "I want justice," they're going to give you justice. <laughs> <laughs> wow, wow, that's that's the amazing. Judge says, "I'll give you the same justice as everybody else gets." <laughs> Right, right. Oh, uh, thank you so much. I really appreciate it, and I hope we can uh, have you back on one of these calls soon because uh, it's a lot of good information and there's a lot of good people out there, you know, um, trying to do the right thing, and uh, I'm sure you're helping a lot of people, same as Yusuf, and um, I thank Yusuf for having you on the show also. Thank you. Hey, thank you for your time. All right. Thank you. And then we have 843-1724. You're on High Frequency Radio. Peace. How are you doing today? Great. Great. Hello. Yeah, so I would just like to say I, I appreciate this this session because it, 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 it's very informative. And I had problems with his web address. I just want to make sure I got it right. D as in David. W as in Win, M as in Miller, LC dot com. Yeah, L is in language, C is in communications dot com. So LC. Okay, thank you, and I appreciate you. And uh, you know, I'm going to your site because I um, and thank you, brother Yusuf, because you're you're magnificent. I'm thanking you for waking us up and helping us free ourselves, and I thank you, Mister Miller. You know, for what you, you do. Thank you. Know, Thank you. We need more people like you. All right. God bless you all. Thank you. Now, they've got one more call in queue. Um, 267-9318. You're on our frequency radio. You hit your mute button if Peace. you got the mute button. Peace. Peace. Okay. What I uh peace to both of you. What I wanted to ask was what do you say when you get in the court or what paperwork do you say? I mean just short and sweet in order to get out of uh prison or get out of since they have the since they seem to have the last word on telling us what we should or shouldn't be doing, then what are the words that we have to uh, 
but not let them lock us up because they feel as though they can tell us what to do or what not to do. Well, if you're in a position of public safety violations, either with speeding, drugs, drunk driving, uh, using a, a weapon, uh, you know, these are violent uh, things. Uh, if anything that goes against public safety will probably result uh, in you being arrested and put in, into jail. The uh, But if you're, if you're there for something that's clerical, uh, and it, it's not a serious issue, your your statement is the claimant, for the claimant's knowledge of the facts is with the claim of the correct sentence structure, communication, parse, syntax, grammar, with the laws, rules, regulations, and codes for the voidness of the perjury. That's one sentence. <laughs> Well, if they're going to go ahead and use fictitious conveyance of language to you, then they're committing perjury. And they're ordering you to join with your perjury because if you're not lying together, you're going to be laying together. So it's important that you understand and not just that one little piece of the sentence. You need to understand that there are 50 different tricks and traps that are going to be used on you. A young man a couple of weeks ago went into the court and he stood before the judge for 35 minutes, and he talked in parse syntax grammar, and he did a perfect job. And then the judge said to him, you win. You as an adverb making win a verb. You are free to go. You as a pronoun. Are was an adverb making the word free to be a verb. To was an adverb in future time making go to be a verb. He spoke to him in adverb verb fiction. And the and the young man turned and walked out, only to be beat up in the in the in the hallway by the sheriff's department because he wanted to use quantum to get out of trouble, but then accepted fiction to declare his freedom. If you're going to be correct, you must be 100% correct 100% of the time. If you're going to use fiction, then you better stay in fiction 100% of the time. Right. So pay attention, study, and you might survive. Okay, thank you on that. I just didn't know in reference to fr uh, fiction and... Uh, non-fiction or real, what is what is it that makes it uh, for the person, what is it that makes it fiction to the person? Like, how do you know that it's uh, how do you know that it's fiction? Like, just say for instance you were in court and then you had a light bulb and something said, this is not right. Well, what would make you know that it's, it's fiction? Well, your own your own phraseology. This is not right. Adverb, verb, adverb, verb. Well, you just said nothing. Where's your fact? And you're using a negative word, not. No, unknown, without. See, every time you use negativity, that's a zero. If you're going to communicate or multiply any number by zero, you get zero. If you're going to use any positive statement and then multiply it by a negative word, which is zero, you're going to end up with zero. So you have to watch your prefixes, like un, well, un well. means no, de means no, in means no, im means no. It's always going to be a vowel and, and a vowel independent, a vowel and two consonants, or it's going to be a prefix dealing with a a negative uh you can look up the word prefixes in a, a large unabridged dictionary and it'll give you all the prefixes and the value of a negativity of what they mean. So stay away from all those kinds of words and you'll probably have a positive contract and let your paperwork plead your case, not your speaking. Does two plus two equal four? Yeah. Does T O plus T O O equal F O R? 
C-W-O and P-O-O equals F-O-R-E. Did you hear what I said, what I meant, what I said, what I said, what I meant, what I said? All right. You see, an oral argument is subjective interpretation based on sounds, but there's 150 ways to write 2 plus 2 equals 4. So if you're going to play word games or try to use a word argument to get out of a, a, a specific problem, uh, you better think twice about it. All right. Mm-hmm. All right. <laughs> I, I I get what you mean now. Yeah. Right. Thank you. You're welcome. I always like to Thank use you that. Two, that I always like to use that two plus two is four. I think that is a, a beautiful example of how you can go into um, and do oral arguments, and it can be subjectively interpreted many different ways. Many different ways. Um, you know that, got, that you know that paragraph floating around the internet where every single word is misspelled. Doesn't uh-huh. matter in what order the word the letters are in the words. Remember that one. Right. You can still read it. Yeah. 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 And everybody yeah. and everybody still reads it. And I've won twelve cases in federal court with that, where I I put it up there and I had the judge look at it. That's this is when it first came out. And the judge looked at it and he says, Mr. DEA, please read this back to me. And he reads it back without making a mistake. Next thing out of the judge's mouth was case dismissed. He says, you proved your point that the district attorney was babbling when he, he wrote his papers. He was babbling when he made his presentation. And I know what he just read to me was all wrong and babbled. He says, so, yeah, we know that he has never said anything in here. So he doesn't have a case. Case dismissed. You're free to go. And my client walked out. Wow. I never thought about that. That was good. That that was a good. That was good. That was good. Hey, I think I have one more caller. I'm going to take one more call, and then I'm going to let you, you uh, make some closing statements, and then we're going to end the show, okay? All right. Very good. All right. Uh, 678-8067. You're on high frequency radio. Hey, greetings, everybody. everybody. Greetings. I am um I'm a lover of math and um uh, I just had a few questions and uh comment. I, I love it. Uh and you were you were saying that most of the uh, negative words are uh, actually it, it actually adds up more than positive words. Is, am I am I correct or just Well the negative negative words are really just understanding that uh when you go into the dictionary you can look up prefixes uh, and the pre, all your prefixes mean future. The, well, the future doesn't ex- exist, so therefore it's a no word. And then when you do your vowel and two consonant words as well, and if you put one single word of negativity in a positive sentence, you will have a negative sentence because zero times any number is zero. So a lie times any fact would be a lie. <clears throat> so when you read my website, which is 400 pages long, all those documents that are in there are written in now time positive language. And if you took any one of them and you, you put into it a negative word, it would take, take any independent sentence and, dis- and vacate it as being a negative sentence and change the and value of the, it. And you said the, uh, the uh, verbs and adjectives are more negative and uh, nouns and pronouns, uh, is that what you were saying? No, what I'm saying is that we don't use adverbs, we don't use adjectives, and we don't use pronouns because adverb, A-D-V, means no contract. Adjective, A-D-J, means no contract. Pronoun, P-R-O, means no. N-O means no. And U-N means no, means no contract. So therefore, if they are... If somebody's advertising that they're not going to make a contract with you and are only going to speak and write in negativity, the end result is nothing. You're going to you're going to say nothing about nothing and get nothing in return. But you can pay two hundred and fifty dollars an hour to say nothing until your money runs out. Oh, I was just trying to get a good understanding. And uh, uh, one uh, one more thing, you. Uh, do you use any of those Fibonacci numbers? Uh, uh, I guess uh, 
uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, formulas. Uh, uh, I was just curious about it. I'm a math major myself, so I'm looking. I'm kind of looking up. You see. <laughs> no, the only so, reason we use a numbering system is because. To put the write a word adjective instead of using the number three requires ten more letters, and I've only got a little tiny space, a sixteenth of an inch th high, between one line and another line. When we first brought out the numbering system, because the court was double spacing everything, this was beautiful. We had a half inch space to write the numbers in and identify all the parts of speech. So then the next thing they did was they they put the words together, one on top of another, and completely took all spacing out. So we used colored pens, and we identified, I think it was an adverb in orange, a verb with green, an a adjective with red, and a, a, a uh, yellow with a pronoun. And so it was color-coded, color and we could stand back 30 feet from the jury and hold up a color-coded document and explain what the value of the words were and saying, where's my prepositional phrase to certify the value of a noun or the wow. value of a fact, and the jury ruled in our favor, and so they went back to double spacing. <laughs> wow. Because, you know, they used to put single spacing. That's 300 words on a page for $100. Then they went to space and a half, where they only had 200 pages on a 200 words on a page for $100. Then they went to double spacing with 100 words on a page for $100. Now they they increased the borders from from one inch to one and a half inches, so there's only 75 words on a page for $100. Remember the 99 cent hamburger that was four inches across? Now you pay four dollars for a two inch hamburger. <laughs> Don't yeah, not, the bridge, lower the river. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's great. That. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Thanks a lot for your show. Thanks a lot for the information. Just was curious about it, and and uh, mm -hmm. <clears throat> thanks a lot for the for the for the math. Take care. You're welcome. Have a good day. Thank you. Okay, David, we're gonna end the show now. I'm gonna let you. If you got any last words that you want to say. Um, you know, to the uh, public, you got something coming up, anything like that right now. Now's the time. You can say there's still a lot of listeners on the phone listening. I give you, you know, a couple of minutes to say what you want to say. All right. For those of you that are facing foreclosure and seeing how there's 25 million foreclosures of the 64 million homes in America taking place right now, there is remedy the foreclosure uh, is your mortgage is a fraud and you're entitled to a 35% whistleblower's fee for having your, your mortgage syntaxed and then a lawsuit prepared which is bonded. With, we, we, glue, we glue and staple the documents together so they're bonded as a maritime court vessel, and then that gets sent to the Attorney General, the tort Eric Holder in Washington, D.C., for criminal prosecution, uh, to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, to the Postal Inspector, to the Securities and Exchange Commission, which also charges $25 million for fraudulent mortgages, which are entitled to a 30% royalty for preparing the case and, and making forensic evidence available to them so that the stock market is not cheated by the, the uh, crime. You know, Stalin nationalized Russia in 1917. Mao Zedong did it in China in 1934. The bankers started in 1934 to nationalize the American housing market by using fraud and misleading statements and securitized backed assets to capture the American housing market and, and gain more power than the United States government. Well, with Parse syntax grammar and the mathematical interface, to stop and correct wrongs, we have been able to stop the takeover of the American home dream where people can actually own something as Lodial, L-O-D-I-A-L, entities to have a 
clear title to have to have a quiet title, which means no one can ever challenge your ownership of your property and do it with the correct parse syntax grammar. These are the things we are bringing to the American people to protect the sovereignty of America so it isn't sold off to foreign investors all over the world. So the technology that we have is very sound. It's mathematically certified. There are going to be people that are going to make negative remarks about me on the Internet, but those remarks are written in adverb verb for one thing. They are misleading statements because they change everything that is correct into something that is not correct. Our, pr our program is mathematically certified, and we do only one thing. I don't do anything in the criminal department. I only do grammar. And I address, as a federal postal judge, I address grammar. And grammar controls all contracts, and contracts control all matter. So therefore, to do it correct, I'm in control of making things correct on a global basis in 150 languages. So a lot of work, but I love my work. And I've been at it 33 years with 80,000 hours of background, and I have a 200 IQ to process the information at a very high rate of speed. I read about 400 words a second in number codes. This isn't your regular mainstream, and it take, takes a lot of practice to get to reading in number codes. But when you read in number codes, you're going to see a whole different world of being able to identify fraud from a fact. Okay. So with that okay. said, my website okay. is cwmlc.com, and I thank you for your time. Okay. Thank you, David, so much. Got him. I, I wasn't trying to rush you, but we got like probably about 60 to 90 seconds left. I took it all the way as far as I could. And I want to invite you back. I'll contact you a little bit afterwards, uh, but we would love to have you again. I know you probably have some other things you wanted to get into, um, but I appreciate you. Thank you, and you have a wonderful evening, okay? Thank you for your time. Have a good day. Thank you. And thank everybody out there for listening to High Frequency Radio. We'll be back tomorrow with National Agenda, and I'll see you on Friday. Peace to all the gods and goddesses. Peace.